And we're going to begin reading in verse 7, Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll just, actually that's the only verse we're going to read. Hebrews 11 verse 7. And the Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Our Father, we're thankful for this day and thankful, Lord, for the truth that we've just read in your word. And now I pray as we explore it and as we, as we meditate on it, as we talk about it, Lord, take this truth and as the song said, plant it deep in us and shape and fashion us in your likeness. And may we be conformed to the image of Christ and not this world. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. December, December is the month of giving gifts. Maybe that's why we like it so much. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the most wonderful time of the year, as, as Andy Williams likes to tell us, or uh, liked to tell us. Children enjoy receiving gifts. And they're excited to unwrap those presents on Christmas morning. Uh, parents also enjoy it. I found myself on Christmas morning this year sitting by the tree all by myself in the dark with the lights, the tree lights on and nobody else up. I'd had my coffee. I was waiting. I finally went and woke everybody else up. Let's open <laughs> presents, right? And so parents enjoy it just as much as children do. Um, uh, but do you know what is the greatest problem with December? Some of you might say snow, but no, it's Christmas. You're supposed to have snow at Christmas, all right? The great, greatest problem with December is that it ends, right? And, and not just that it ends. I mean, that's part of the problem. That's half the problem. But the, the second part of the problem is that it is directly followed by January, <laughs> right? And, and wouldn't people say, Happy New Year, right? Was like, happy New Year. It was December. Now it's January. You want me to be happy about that, <laughs> Right? Uh, and so, um, couldn't we just start in April? I mean, wouldn't it be much happier? Because we love the snow in December, but not in January, right? So let's just go straight to April, skip all of that stuff. Uh, but now December is the month of getting, giving gifts. If that's so, what is January? What is, January is the month of returning gifts, right? <laughs> that's the month where you said, I hope we saved the receipt. And uh, uh, if you're like me, you purchased a bunch of small, cheap toys for stocking stuffers, right? And what's the problem with small, cheap toys? They don't work, <laughs> right? That's the problem. And so we find ourselves looking for those receipts to take them back. And, uh, and they, the problem is those things, they just don't do what they're supposed to do. And what do you do with a toy that doesn't work? You take it back, right? Well, on that principle, I believe there are many people who have a claim to faith, but they need to return it. They need to take it back to wherever they got it because it doesn't do, their professed faith does not do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't work. Now, we are saved by grace through faith. When we talk about the matter of the salvation of our souls, we're saved by faith uh, by grace through faith. You cannot earn salvation through good works. You receive salvation by God's grace through faith in Christ. And it is faith alone, not faith plus works, not faith plus some sort of merit. Faith alone saves. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that's not the end of the story. And a lot of times we like to draw the line right there and say, all right, saved by grace Awesome. Uh, but we're saved by faith, uh, not works, by grace, not works. Um, but when we are saved by faith, that saving faith moves us to good works. And so Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so faith that saves works. If we have faith that saves us, that same faith will create in us good works. Um, James 2.14 says, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now faith saves us, but what, the, what James is saying is, can that kind of faith save him? A faith that has no works, and the, what's the answer to that question? No. 
right? James chapter 2, verse 17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. So faith that saves works. How does it do that? All right. In what ways will saving faith work in us? How does that play out? And what does that look like in real life? Well, the author of Hebrews sought to encourage these first century Jewish believers to whom he, he wrote this book of Hebrews. They were struggling in their faith. And they had begun as, as believers in Christ, as the Messiah, as their, as their Savior, they had begun to experience persecution for their new religion. We read a lot about that in, in chapter 10. Uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, if, if the, the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back to perdition, but of them who believe to the saving of the soul. And so he's laying that groundwork. You guys are struggling with your faith. You're tempted to draw back from your faith. And, and so, in fact, they, uh, they wanted, several of them were thinking about going back to Judaism because that was a legally recognized religion in the, in the Roman Empire. Uh, so there would be no official persecution. Of course, they'd been ostracized from the community in which they grew up. And so now what? When all that's going on, the whole world's against them, what would their faith look like in that situation? Could they abandon the church and still fit in the world? and then still make a claim to faith in Christ? Or uh, how would faith work in them when the whole world was against them? That's maybe the question of the hour for the first recipients of this letter of Hebrews. Can you think of a good example of a man who lived out his faith when the whole world was against him? Well, the writer of Hebrews said, hmm, I know a guy. Oh, yeah. I'm that corny, all right? Uh, but he, he comes up with Noah, right? Noah uh, lived out his faith while the whole world was against him. And, and we know that saving faith works in us. And through Noah's example, uh, I want to explore how that happens, how saving faith works in us. What does it do? Well, there's three things, because I'm a Baptist. Saving faith does three things, three points, all right? First of all, Faith causes us to obey God. As it works itself out in us, faith causes us to obey God. As children, we used to sing the, the or I grew up singing uh, the song, Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Uh, and then you get to spell it at some point, right? Uh, that's a great song. And uh, if, if you have the faith that saves, you have faith that submits to the Lord and your faith will move you to obedience. Here in verse 7, our text again, By faith Noah, being warned of God of the things which not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. See, God came to Noah and he warned him of something that Noah had never seen. In fact, nobody had seen what, what God had warned Noah about. God said, he is going to flood the entire earth with water. That's pretty far-fetched, all right? Pretty far-fetched. Why? Why was God going to flood the, the world with water? Well, mankind had become so exceedingly wicked, so much so that God, God decided to end them all and start over. There was just no, there was no revival going to happen here. There was no special movement going to happen. God was going to judge the whole world. In Genesis chapter 6, we pick up the narrative there in verse 3. And he says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, that they bare children of them. And the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, 
and that every imagination of the thoughts of his hearts were only evil continually, and it repented the Lord, or it grieved the Lord, that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And I want you to, just from that passage of Scripture, just to uh, think about Noah's context Look at the world in which Noah lived. There's some some uh, features of Noah's day, of Noah's generation, of the world in which he lived that I think we might look at here. The world at his time was dominated by by wicked men, but not just wicked men. The wicked men were in power. They were powerful men uh, that were running the world, and and these wicked men are described as giants. Mighty men and men of renown. In other words, they were the respected ones in society. They were the powerful ones. Uh, and, and they were even physically imposing. They were giants. Uh, the, the thoughts of every human were fixated on evil and rebellion against God. There was basically nothing good going on. Verse 11 describes the society as being corrupt and overrun with violence. And so verse 3 tells us, probably maybe the most significant uh, feature of Noah's day, and that is, or the most sig significant feature of Noah's days is that those days were numbered. God said there will be 120 years and then I am bringing an end to this thing. Noah was in all of this, the whole world, uh, constantly, even their imaginations, always evil, yet Noah was righteous. By faith, he had found grace, he had received salvation, and life, and, and he was living a life of good works. In verse 8 of Genesis 6, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And so here, how do we describe Noah? First of all, he's a man who found grace in God's eyes. All right? Uh, that doesn't mean he achieved something. That means that God gave him grace. When we go back to our text, it's by faith because we receive the grace of God by faith. But Noah is also described as, as a just man. That is, God had made Noah righteous. He was right with God. He was just. Noah was perfect, it says here, meaning that he lived a blameless lifestyle. No one could ever point the finger at Noah and accuse him credibly of any evil action or attitude. Um, Noah was perfect. Noah was obedient to God. In Genesis 6.22 and again in Genesis 7.5, the Bible says of Noah... Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so he did. He was an obedient servant of the Lord. So God came to Noah, this righteous man, this just man, this blameless man. God came to Noah, who had found grace in his eyes, and he warned him that he would flood the earth, and then he commanded him to build, to construct an ark. In Genesis 6.13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come to me, for the earth is filled with violence, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with all the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Now, Noah did just that. He obeyed God. Faith causes us to obey God. Now, we'll return here from Genesis to our text in Hebrews. Um, and and uh, here in our text, I, I, I want to point out two defining features of the obedience of faith. Two features that are that are uh, strongly descriptive of faith that obeys. And, and the first thing is this. The obedience of faith is specific. It is a specific obedience. It's not ambiguous. It's not mystical. It's not like nailing jello to the wall. It is specific and concrete obedience. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, our text, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen yet as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah believed God's warning, and so he, <clears throat> excuse me, he did what God commanded him to do, and he did it exactly how God told him to do it. God told Noah what type of wood to use. I don't know what type of wood gopher wood is. I mean, that's not the point of this message, to get all the details correct. That was Noah's job. I'll let him handle that, all right? Ken Ham got it pretty good. I'll let him handle that. Uh, but God told Noah what type of wood to use, so he used that. God told Noah how to waterproof it. 
uh, to pitch it within and without. God told Noah the dimensions of the ark in, in Genesis 6, 15, 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Now, I can't tell you exactly how that has been, but I've been to the ark in Kentucky, and i got to tell you, it's big, all right? It's pretty impressive. God told him where to put the windows and where to put the door. God told him to make three decks. God told Noah that he would bring all the animals in by twos for the clean animals, um, by twos and sevens. I think sevens are the clean animals. Um, so Noah had to prepare the ark to accommodate all those animals. He had to plan their food, plan their cages, uh, plan how they, they would feed them and all that stuff. What Noah was doing was absolutely crazy if not for the fact that God told him to do it. All right, Noah did not pick and choose which parts of God's command that he was going to obey and then leave others out. He did it all, and he did it without exception. And guess what? It wasn't easy. It was difficult. In fact, it was so difficult, it took Noah and his sons 120 years to build that ark. Now, Noah did not leave any of God's command out. But this is important. He did not add anything to God's command either. He did not modify the plan. He didn't say, you know, Lord, you said to build this ark and I'm going to build it. Uh, but there's some other things that I need to do first. Before I get around to doing, I, I've got some other things. He didn't say, uh, you know, I, got, I know God said that to build three decks. But I need a fourth. I want to build four decks on this thing because uh, I just need some entertainment space or something like that. Um, he didn't say I need the fourth deck because, you know, God, uh, God just didn't plan for all of the animals. I need one more deck. That's a lot of animals, uh, so we'll put them all in there. No, uh, he said I, uh, he didn't say I'm going to build my ark right after this year's election because if the wrong person gets in office, then I can't build my ark. Because I gotta have, I gotta have the right conditions. He he didn't do that. He he didn't say God has called me to build an ark, so I'm going to build two arks, and I'm going to build a temple, and that'll attract more people in uh, to to get things to get things working. No, you see, the obedience of faith is a direct response to God's word. And it's a direct response to God's specific commands. So God's word, the Bible, gives us God's will in specific details. So many people are trying to do something great for God or to find God's will in some sign or some wonder or some miracle or some voice from heaven, and yet at the same time, they will not search the scriptures. Some poor, and I, I don't say this to mock this person or this group. I, I say this... Um, in all sincerity, but some poor mother out in California at Bethel Church in Redding, California, she lost her little daughter, a little two-year-old girl. Uh, her name was Olive. And when this little girl died, her poor mother, she said, God told her that her daughter's time on this earth was not done, that he was going to raise her from the dead. And so for six days, that church held a revival service, where they sang and they did praise and worship and they did all kinds of things. And uh, the, the, the video that went viral was them singing, Wake Up Olive in Jesus' Name. Wake Up Olive in Jesus' Name. It was trending on Twitter, hashtag Wake Up Olive. Well, she didn't wake up. And so Bethel Church spent those six days trying to raise the toddler from the dead and on the seventh day they had to bury her. And the mother is heartbroken and the world is pointing and laughing and mocking. Why? Because God never promised her that he would raise her daughter. At least not now. I mean, God does promise to raise all who believe in Christ from the dead. That is a promise we have from God. We don't have a promise that we get to choose when. Right? That's his choice. And so people like to put words in God's mouth. By the way, do you like it when someone puts words in your mouth? Kids are good at that. You know, Dad, you promised. Sometimes they're right. I promised something. I forgot about it. Sometimes I said something and they took it as a promise, right? And uh, so if we don't like it when people put words in our mouths, what do you think God 
Do you think God likes it when we put words in his mouth? No. And so the obedience of faith, it's specific. It's not adding to God's word. It's not taking from it. But it is a response to God's word specifically. Obedience is also a reverence for God's word. This specific obedience. It's reverence for God's word. Here it says in our text that Noah was moved with fear to prepare that ark. Noah had faith in God, but he also had a healthy fear of God. And if you do not have a healthy fear of God, I wonder if you have faith in him either. Uh, what does it mean that Noah was moved with fear? What does that mean? Well, the word translated fear, it literally means taking hold well. There's compound Greek word put together there. It, it, it means to take hold of something and, and hold on to it well and tightly. And, and namely, taking hold of God's warning here in the case of Noah and holding on to it. Now, a Christian does not fear the wrath of God. The wrath of God was poured out on Christ on the cross on our behalf. And uh, that's been taken away from us. But a Christian ought to fear the chastening hand of God, as we find in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 5 through 8. Uh, we ought to understand that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. In other words, he disciplines his children. And that is not a fear of terror. It's not, a, it's not that we're terrified that God is going to destroy us, but it is a healthy fear of, of love and a relationship between child and father. And it is a real fear coupled with a reverent awe of God. I struggle to describe this fear, so I appeal to Thomas Watson, the Puritan, who wrote in 1681, he wrote this so eloquently, when the soul looks either to God's holiness or to its own sinfulness, it fears. But it is a fear mixed with faith in Christ's merits. The soul trembles, yet trusts, like a ship which lies at anchor, Though it shakes with the wind, yet it is fixed at anchor. God in great wisdom couples these two graces of faith and fear. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Um, perhaps Charles Spurgeon said it better. He writes, you see, faith and fear can live in the same heart. And they can work together to build the same ark. Faith and fear are very sweet companions when the fear is filial fear, a holy dread of disobeying God, when we are moved with that fear, our faith becomes, and listen to this, practical. Practical. Noah responded to God's word in reverent fear. And what did he do? He built an ark. That's pretty practical, if you ask me. He believed God's warning and then he acted according to it. And by the way, if you believe the world will be covered with water, you'll be compelled to build an ark. I believe that, just to, just to throw a plug in here, I do believe that, J that Ken Ham believes that the book of Genesis is the word of God. Now, you know how I can be so confident in that? The man actually built an ark. All right, now it's not supposed to float, but I, I, I try to put myself in his mindset. Yes, I believe it. Could I, could I actually get myself to construct that giant ark and try to make that thing float business-wise? <laughs> uh, not me. I wouldn't have that kind of faith. Uh, but God uses people in unique ways. I'm kind of glad he didn't call me to build an ark, but... Um, anyway, uh, if you believe, Noah believed the world would be covered with water, that compelled him to build an ark. The obedience of faith is specific in that it is a response to God's word and it is a reverence for God's word. We're moved with that reverent awe and fear of God. Now, the obedience of faith is not just specific, but we could take it a step further and say the obedience of faith is active. It is active, not just passive. And in verse 11 or verse 7 here, our text, it says that Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Spending 120 years building a giant boat sounds like an awful lot of work to me. But that's what faith does. 
It moves us to action. And so the, the faith that is obedient, it is active faith. Now, we know that saving faith works. It works in us. How does that work? Well, first, saving faith causes us to obey God. Secondly, I want you to notice that faith causes us to separate from the world. Faith not only moves us to obey God, but it causes us to separate from the world. Christians are different from the rest of the world, and that difference is not mystical. And that difference is not emotional. That difference is practical. It is tangible. It is visible. The difference happens because God regenerates a believer in Christ. We are born again and God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our lives. And by God's grace, we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is what that is the end to which we are predestined according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. And the rest of the world isn't going to do that. That's why in Romans 12, 2, we're commanded, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The rest of the world is lost in sin and has an adverse relationship to God. So it is no wonder that saving faith works in us to cause us to be separate from the world. Now, when a preacher says the word separation, many Christians gasp in horror. <gasps> he said the S word. All right. Men, imagine that we are supposed to be just a little more weird than everybody else. Ladies get visions of full-length denim dresses and head coverings and are terrified, right? But that may be a bit extreme. See, that, that kind of... We're not just trying to be different from the world. In fact, separation is not about being intentionally different from the world. Separation is about being like Christ, who is not of this world. And so, um, we, but, but uh, the truth is Christians are too cozy and comfortable in this world. Now, before you think I'm just preaching at you, that comes all the way around to me too. And so I, I feel the struggle. I know the struggle is real. But we're too comfortable in this world many times. We know this world is not our home. You ever sang that song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through? Um, and so we, we think, well, I, I, this world's not my home, I won't be an, a homeowner, but I'm going to sign that long-term lease. I'm going to get a timeshare, all right? And, and, and I'm going to be like just not, uh, this world isn't my home, but man, I want to I do a lot of visiting. Uh, I, I, we get comfortable in it. And many Christians decry and deride the idea of separation here on earth. But they will want separation at the final judgment. You know, when God separates the sheep from the goats, unbelievers then will be consigned to eternal damnation and believers to life everlasting. And then we're going to want separation. Then we're going to want to be separate from the world. But not now. Why? Because we're too much in love with the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, said the Apostle John. Saving faith works in us, and it works in us to separate us from the world. How does it do that? How does faith separate us from the world? Uh, well, it does it, first of all, by practice. A separation in contrast. Faith separates us from the world by practice. If you uh, will live a holy life, your unholy friends will stop hanging out with you. They'll probably make fun of you first to try to shame you into rejoining them. Uh, but they're going to, after a while, they'll hate it. They'll think you're weird for being like Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Peter describes this phenomena. Uh, he says in verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. So he's saying in your past life, before you were saved, you lived like they live. You lived like they want. And he describes that. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. 
So do you hear that? They think it's strange you won't go along with them anymore in these things. So you used to go along with them, and now you're not doing that anymore, and they think you're weird because of it. What is the will of the Gentiles? How do they want to live? As described in these verses, he, he talks about an unrestrained sexual lust. He describes lasciviousness, that is lewdness. He just... Uh, plain lust, uh, excess of wine, that's drinking parties. Hey, you know, you, you might hear about it uh, when you get back to work after the new year, right? Everybody talking about how they can't even remember what they did on New Year's Eve because they were so smashed, right? Uh, and then, hey, if they know you're a Christian, they might poke at you. How, what did you do? Well, I, you know, I didn't do that. Why not? What's wrong with you, right? Um, so there's drinking parties or drunkenness involved here. Revelings talks about drunkenness along with sexual immorality that was done and is done at parties in the will of the Gentiles. And so the, the uh, will of the Gentiles is to live in unrestrained sexual lust. It is also the will of the Gentiles, basically the, talking about the pagans here, the unbelievers, it is their will to live in spiritual deception. Uh, and it, he uses here, and, and Peter uses the term idolatries. And idolatry is spiritual deception. In other words, man invents God in his image. You know, God created man in his image, and then we fell into sin, and now man wants to create God in his image. So that the gods that they create approve of their own desires. Noah lived in a pre-Christian society and we live in a post-Christian society. What does that mean? Well, it means that the pagans of today know how to speak Christianese. They know how to talk about Jesus. They know how to speak about grace. They know how to say all the catch words. But they're pagans and they hate God and his word. But many of them will make some sort of claim to be a Christian while denying all the things that God tells us. And so unbelievers, pagans, they want to live in unrestrained sexual lust and spiritual deception. And when a Christian says, no, I won't do that, I won't go along with that, they say, what's wrong with you? Who are you to judge me? Because you're not going along with them and not approving of it means to them that you judge them. How? Do you separate from the world? Live a holy life. Love Christ more than the sins of our culture. Don't worry, at that point, the world will separate from you. Noah was the only righteous man living in the world full of wicked men. His very life was a rebuke to this world. His testimony condemned the conduct of those pagans. And so we read in our text, that he built an ark, or prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. Now, by the which, that term refers back to, not to building an ark, but it refers back to the beginning of the verse, by faith. By faith he built an ark, by faith he condemned the world. Noah condemned the world by his faith. What does it mean that Noah condemned the world? It means that he pronounced judgment upon this world. He pronounced that they were guilty and deserving of God's punishment. His very lifestyle said this, and then by faith he built an ark. Noah's ark is, again, remember, the outward manifestation of his faith. It's the practical obedience to which his faith led him. And so Noah's ark itself condemned the world. How does it do that? Well, before the flood, by building an ark, Noah demonstrated that he, was, that, or that he believed that everybody deserved to die in the impending doom of the flood. All right, When he built that ark, that's what he was saying. Uh, and no doubt they would ask him, what's with the ark? <laughs> and he's saying, everybody's going to die. Why? Noah, who are you to judge us to say that we deserve to die? The very presence of that structure rebuked their sin, their faithfulness, and their, their faithlessness and their godliness. By the way, Jesus Christ today is the ark of our salvation. Only those in Noah's day, only those in the ark were saved from doom, from death. And today, only those in Christ will be saved from the flood of God's wrath that is to come. And when you proclaim your faith in Christ, you pronounce judgment on every soul who refuses to do so. 
That's the offense of the cross. That's the offense of the gospel. And that brings me to the second way in which we separate from the world. Not only do we do so by practice, but we separate from the world by preaching too. You say, well, pastor, that's your job. You, you do the preaching. Uh, we'll leave that up to you. Well, yes, in a way, I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm preaching the Sunday message, but every Christian is a preacher. Every Christian is a missionary. We are called by Christ to take the gospel to every creature. And so we, we, um, we separate from the world by preaching. And specifically, Noah was preaching righteousness, and we are to preach righteousness. Noah proclaimed God's righteousness to his generation. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, speaking of Noah in his time, it says that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And then it describes him here, a preacher of righteousness, bringing a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He did not preach gleefully, Noah wasn't happy that anybody would die. Um, he preached earnestly. Noah desired for people to join him on the ark. He wanted them to be saved. And if you have trouble separating from worldly friends, share the gospel with them. They will either separate from you or they will believe the gospel, be born again, and you will have gained eternal friends. Someone has rightly said, practice what you preach. But I think it is just as correct to say, preach what you practice. Um, and so we ought to preach God's righteousness. We ought to preach righteousness. And then we ought to preach relentlessly. Here Noah preached the righteousness of God for how long? <laughs> 120 years. Is that a long time? I think so. Yeah. Peter, 1 Peter 3.20 says, When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The long-suffering of God is displayed in Noah's day. You see, God didn't just say, I'm going to wipe everybody out, and I'll maybe just create a little island and put Noah on that. And so it can be done immediately. No, God made 120 years. And for that time, Noah preached righteousness. And, and, and for that time, God extended his grace to a lost and damned world. All that time, Noah not only built an ark, but he pleaded with souls to be saved. No doubt, they ridiculed him. That is separation. <clears throat> we know that saving faith works and works in us. And how does it do that? Well, saving faith, first of all, it causes us to obey God. Secondly, it causes us to separate from the world. Finally, faith causes us to inherit righteousness. And this is the best part about saving faith. It causes us to inherit righteousness. Again, our text, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. When you have faith in Christ, he gives you his righteousness and makes you accepted in God's kingdom, for there in God's kingdom only the righteous may enter. How did Noah become the heir of righteousness? He did so by faith. If you examine our text, you'll see that faith did three things in Noah. Faith caused him to prepare an ark. Faith caused him to condemn the world. And then faith caused him to become the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah did not become righteous by building an ark. He was already righteous when God came to him and warned him and told him to build that ark. He had already become righteous because he had put his faith in the Lord and building the ark was the act of an already righteous man. By the way, Noah, as an Old Testament faith, became righteous by faith and his sins were paid for by Christ on the cross. Every Old Testament saint put their faith in God. Now, they didn't know everything that we know, but they knew all that God told them and they put their faith in Christ or, or in God and, and, and that was enough. By faith, they're saved. Christ saved them. And that's a sidebar. But through faith, um, 
uh, let's see, built, building the ark for Noah was the act of an already righteous man. Righteousness simply means right standing with God. That's what it means. It means right standing with God. We are born in sin, but, uh, but uh, by sin we have, all have wrong standing with God. We're enemies to God naturally through faith, though, and being justified, we are made right with God. That's righteousness. And how does it work? How does faith make us the inheritance, the inheritors of righteousness? Well, uh, two ways. First, we, we inherit righteousness by adoption. By adoption. Here it says that Noah became heir of righteousness. In other words, he's going to have an inheritance. What kind of people inherit? Well, usually people inherit from their parents, right? And so this is speaking of adoption. By faith in Christ, we become children of God. Being God's children, we inherit his fortune, so to speak, his heavenly riches. In Ephesians 1.5, the Bible says we are predestined uh, to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to God according to the good pleasure of his will. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says in Christ also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That's kind of God's side of it. Here's our side of it in John 1.12. But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. By faith, those of us who believe on his name, by faith we are adopted into God's family. We are made sons of God and daughters of God, and we inherit his righteousness. It is done by adoption. It is also done, we inherit righteousness. It is done by imputation. In other words, God gives it to us. We don't earn it. God gives it to us. Simply put, we have no righteousness of our own. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves, but God gives us the righteousness of Christ by faith. It's his grace, but we receive it by faith. In Romans 3, again in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all of them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood, <clears throat> To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that we might be just, or that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. There was a transaction on the cross. Christ died to pay the righteous payment for our sins. And on the basis of that payment, we can have his righteousness imputed or given to us with Christ's righteousness. When, we're, when we are united to Christ by faith, we receive his righteousness. We stand sinless before God, right with God. That's what happened to Noah. That's what happens to every person that's born again. Every person who repents and turns to Jesus Christ as their Savior. How is faith working in your life? As you look at your life, take an inventory, just take the quiz real quick. Is faith moving you to cause you to obey God? Does your faith cause you to separate from the world? Or can you just, can you say this morning, my faith has caused me to inherit righteousness. Have you, have you put your faith in Christ and inherited the righteousness that only comes through God? Have you been justified by faith? If faith is doing these things in your life, perhaps... Perhaps the old hymn rings true. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Saving faith works.